start that. That'll carry us uh, through the season of Lent also on Sundays. And so tomorrow, I do want to note again, if you haven't heard, that we're going to be doing these evening prayer services. And that's going to begin at 7 o'clock tomorrow night. And we'll do another one on Friday night. And then next week, we get right on Monday morning, or Monday evening, excuse me. So every weekday night, you can come to church. Okay? That's pretty cool. All right? And no pressure to come. Come as many times as you'd like, or um, you know, be free. You're free to attend. So those begin tomorrow night at 7. Uh, may God bless our time together uh, and bless our Lenten season, deepening it and enriching it that we may cling ever more tightly to Jesus and his promises. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, once again you have gathered us here in this place to receive your good gifts. One thing that we uh, receive tonight that we don't usually receive is an ash cross. Help us to remember our mortality, to remember our frailty, to know that we are sinners in need of a Savior. We thank you that you sent that Savior, your Son, Jesus, our Lord, to die on the cross for us, to forgive us our sins and rise from the dead, that these ashes will not be the end of the story. We thank you for this hope. Strengthen our faith, strengthen our trust in you, in your Son, and in Jesus, and all that he has done for us. We pray it in his name. Amen. Please stand as we begin with our opening hymn, Chief of Sinners, Go I Be.
gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Be with me, O Lord, my bones are Do not remember against us our former iniquities. Help us, O God of our salvation, for the glory of your name. We are dust, and to dust we shall return. But our God is faithful and just, and he remembers us. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess to you that we have broken your commandments by our own thoughts, words, and deeds. We have failed to be the people that you have called us to be. We have not loved our brothers and sisters as we ought. So often we fail to remember your promises, your presence, and your perfect plan. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. And give us the healing power of your love, that we may walk again in your ways and live to the glory of your holy name. Return to the Lord your God, for his gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not return, or he will not turn and relent, and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering, and a drink offering to the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate it fast. Call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, we can say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not their heritage a reproach. They violate among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And the Lord became his jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending you to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will the Lord spurn forever and never again be favorable? Are his promises at an end for all time? Has God forgotten to be gracious? You may be seated. Ashes symbolize mourning for our sin. For the times that we, like sheep, have gone astray, and that we have been guilty of iniquity and transgression. The ashes in the shape of the cross symbolize cleansing and renewal and point to the gift of forgiveness that God gives in Jesus Christ, through whom the Lord has remembered us. I would invite you at this time, if you wish to receive ashes, to come forward for the imposition of ashes. You will receive an ash cross and hear those words. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And uh, you may, if you uh, are not coming forward, of course you may remain seated, and we will sing, Savior, when in dust to thee, during his position. I welcome you forward.
Then I said, I will appeal to this, to the years of the right hand of the Most High. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. I will ponder all your work and meditate on your mighty deeds. You are the God who works wonders. You have made known your might among the peoples. God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and has remembered us and remember his promises. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you despise nothing you have made and forgive the sins of all who are penitent. Create in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, we may receive from you full pardon and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The epistle for this evening is taken from 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, verses 20b to chapter 6, verse 10. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sin he made him to be, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, In a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found in our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, by great endurance and afflictions, hardships, calamities, Beatings, imprisonments, riots, labor, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, be truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness to the right hand and to the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, and yet are true. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor and making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. While this is not the gospel reading that is assigned for Ash Wednesday, this is the gospel reading that we will be using for our Lenten series. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 22nd chapter. Now the Feast of Unleavened Bread drew near, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepare it? He said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters. And tell the master of the house, The teacher says to you, 
Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared it for the Passover. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. May we see it as we sing our theme hymn to go in the darkness center. Jacob that he had been killed by wild beasts. You can guess what that was. 
evil. And in Egypt, Joseph's life was all over the place. It was up and it was down, but finally, by God's blessing, he became this head guy, this head-type leader, ruler in Egypt, and God used Joseph's wisdom and his plan to save many people from starving to death, including his own father and his brothers who had done so much evil to him. Well, then Jacob, father, he died, and Joseph's brothers were then scared because they thought Joseph was finally going to get revenge on them. Did he? No, he did not. He said something to them, this powerful statement about what they had done to him and about all the years that followed. He said, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. And we have to understand Joseph's words rightly. His brothers meant evil evil against him, and it was evil. They meant evil, they did evil. God didn't change any part of that, but God used that evil for a larger purpose, even when no one else knew what was going on. Everyone else was clueless. What could God be up to? But of course, God wasn't clueless. God is never clueless. Again, we're, we're working our way through Luke chapters 22 and 23, and then on to the resurrection victory in Luke chapter 24. And we'll begin tonight by reflecting on the reading that we heard from Luke 22, and we'll highlight some very important truths, three to be exact. The first is this. It's time for a greater Passover. Time for a greater Passover. Five times Luke makes sure to mention that the Passover was going to happen. He doesn't want you to miss what time it is, right? What day it is. He says it in verse 1, verse 7, 8, 11, and 13. And there's a lot that you can say about the Passover. There are so many connections, but tonight we'll say this. The Passover was the time when Israel remembered. And what did they remember? They remembered that they lived under the power of evil. Centuries before this night that Luke is writing about, God's people lived as slaves in Egypt. Evil had come against them. Evil was done to them. Pharaoh and, and the gods of Egypt, they opposed God's plan to set his people free. And even though God sent plague after plague, Pharaoh hardened his heart. And then even after Pharaoh allowed Israel to leave, he changed his mind. He hunted them down, even chasing them through the middle of the Red Sea. Pharaoh meant to destroy them, to put Israel to death. He meant evil. But God meant it for good, to save Israel. And he did. Pharaoh and his army were drowned in the sea, and God's people were rescued. They stepped on dry land, having moved into death and out again into life with their God. Their enemies meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. What God did at the Passover and what he did through the exodus from Egypt he did in a greater way in his son, Jesus. That's the first truth from our reading tonight. It's Passover. Luke doesn't want us to miss that. And it's time for a greater Passover. A greater salvation. A greater deliverance than ever before. A greater movement into death and out again into life. And here's the second truth. Evil is coming against Jesus. Evil men of all kinds and all sorts are aligning against Jesus. And Luke tells us that the evil one, Satan himself, is the driving force behind this plan to destroy Jesus. And we just listen to this lineup of evil in these verses. Verse 2, here at the Passover, the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared 
people. These are the guys, by the way, who are supposed to guide and prepare the people to receive their Messiah. But they're the ones, the very ones, who are looking for a way to put that Messiah to death. And Luke tells us where they feared the people. Did they think that the the people were going to rise up and defend Jesus and stop them from doing evil to him? Well, if that's what they were thinking, they greatly overestimated the people's faith and courage, as we will see. But it wasn't just these evil religious leaders. Luke goes on in verse 3, Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot. Satan is, he's often described as a, as a strong man in the scriptures. In, uh, in Luke 13, Jesus healed a woman whom Satan had bound with illness for 18 years. In Luke chapter 10, Jesus sent out the 72 disciples and they, they cast out demons. And Jesus said that he saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Satan might be that strong man, but Jesus is the stronger man who has come to bind Satan. And here he is, the evil one, who engages in the battle to destroy Jesus. And who does Satan use? He uses one of the twelve. He uses Judas. We might, we might have gotten so used to hearing the story that we, uh, that we might miss the tragedy of that. Even though Judas was one of the twelve and spent years with Jesus, Satan used him. And we don't really know how, we, we really can't guess it, how this all went down, but, but Judas was used by Satan. And he's the one who approached the chief priests and made a plan with them. And of course, they thought they needed to avoid a crowd because of fear, but the people will turn on Jesus too and demand for him to be crucified. The evil was bad enough at the first Passover, and here on that evening of the Passover in our text, it's much worse. All of this evil is coming against Jesus. And here's the third truth from the reading. It's all made more beautiful because of all that evil that we highlighted in the second truth. And we think of all this evil like the brewing darkness of the sky when a thunderstorm is coming. You've got human enemies. You've got a human traitor. And then you've got, of course, the, the great supernatural enemy. They're all joined together. They join forces, whether they know it or not. And they're going to go against Jesus. And as we know, their plan was going to work even better than they hoped. People would not defend Jesus. They would cry out for his death alongside them. Uh, this reading is filled with all this brewing evil that's going to happen. But this third truth, this third truth for you, friends, hits us in, in verse 7 and four more times when Luke tells us everything is ready. Everything is prepared. Prepare the Passover. Where shall we prepare? A large upper room furnished, prepared there. And they prepared the Passover. Prepared and ready. Everything is prepared and ready. Now, it's quite possible that Jesus was exercising his power as God when he told them, you know, there's this man that's going to meet you. Follow him. The master of the house will show you. And so on. But Luke doesn't say that. And we could and should probably just take this in a very ordinary way. Jesus made arrangements. He was making sure that everything was ready and prepared. Why? Because Jesus is ready and prepared. He knew about the evil. He knew what was coming. He knew that all he would have left was to trust and to know that the Father's plan was coming true, that the Father's plan would come true. And that's why in the Gospel according to Luke, only in the Gospel according to Luke, the last thing that Jesus said from the cross was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
evil was coming. And God's plan, God's plan was for evil to do its worst, for sin and for Satan to rule. Only in Luke does Jesus say this when he was arrested. This is your hour and the power of darkness. But Jesus is ready. And Jesus knows that in this greater rescue than what Joseph did for his brothers, in this greater exodus than Moses did, that his enemies mean everything for evil, and they would do the ultimate evil, but his father meant it for good. And the greatest salvation of all will come. Peter thought that he was ready to die with Jesus, but he wasn't. The women don't believe that Jesus will rise from the dead, and so they got spices ready, and on that first Easter, they went to the tomb to anoint his corpse. But they were wrong. Jesus is ready. And he's ready to face the evil and take it into himself. And he knew that God the Father would raise him from the dead and give victory over sin and evil that will never pass away. Everything is now ready. What part are we tempted to play in the evil that comes against Jesus? We're going to explore that this Lenten season. And by God's grace, once again, we'll repent and we'll turn away from that evil, whatever form, whatever it looks like in our lives. What doubts plague you as you see the power of evil in our world? How often does fear cripple you and deceive you into thinking that maybe God can be taken off guard, that he wasn't ready for the evil this time? This Lenten season, friends, we'll open up our fears, our doubts, and we'll give them to Jesus because he has undone the evil because he lives forever. And because he lives, nothing, not death, nor life, nor Satan, nor any struggle, nor anything else, nothing can separate us from God's love and his crucified, risen, ascended, and yet to return son, Jesus, who was and is ready. And when our Lenten journey is done, how will our faith be different? Well, I suppose that our faith is never different because it's always the same in the sense that we hold on to God's promises and we completely rely on Jesus for everything. But I suppose that we can pray that our grip will tighten as we hold on to Him. And we can also pray that our mouths will be open and we will say to Satan, and to every enemy, and weirdly even to ourselves, you can't take God by surprise. Jesus is ready, ever ready to save and to redeem. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In Jesus' name, amen. Please stand. Let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God. Father and Son, 
For the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead. I like the Lord. Friends in Christ, I urge you all to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and freely promised to hear us. God our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name be hallowed by us in all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Strengthen us by your Spirit, according to your will, both in life and in death in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. In your merciful hands, we commend all who are in need, praying for them at all times, Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Grant us our daily bread, preserve us from greed and selfish cares, and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, Deliver us from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with our offering.
good, right, and sanitary, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many. So with cleansed hearts, we might be prepared joyfully to celebrate the Paschal Feast in sincerity and truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,
We open the cup. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sin. Amen.
Now may this true body and this true blood strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith, now until life everlasting, with heart and peace. Amen. Please stand.
final Easter dawn where we join in heaven's praise. Go in the abounding grace of our Lord. Amen.